Welcome. My name is Patricia Brown and I'm a volunteer on Kettering's Board of Community Relations. The board is made up of nine Kettering residents. Our board mission is to improve intergroup relations and promote fair housing regardless of race, religion, sex, disability, or marital status. This panel discussion is one of the ways we promote our mission. The purpose of this morning's panel discussion is to learn and answer questions about the rights and responsibilities of City of Kettering tenants. To help us understand these rights, let me introduce the panel. John Zimmerman, Miami Valley Fair Housing Center. Matthew Curry, Advocates for Basic Legal Equality. And Joanne Mejias, City of Kettering Chief Code Official. I will turn the meeting over to the panelists. I believe Joanne Mejias, Chief Code Official with the City of Kettering, will be speaking first. Once all of the panelists are done speaking, we will open the floor up to questions. Good morning, I'm Joanne Mejias and I, married, I, I manage the city's property maintenance division. Um, the, property, uh, the city of Kettering has a property maintenance code that's based on the international property maintenance code. The code sets minimum standards for ma maintenance of all properties, commercial, residential, as well as undeveloped parcels. The goal is to ensure a consistent standard of quality and maintenance. Principal part of that goal, which council has clearly expressed, is the highest possible quality of maintenance is a priority. To that end, we look at interior and exterior structures as well as exterior grounds. Um, we look at painting, holes in walls, utilities are in working order, moisture penetrations, windows and doors, the condition of um, uh, other elements on the, on the structure. We look at tall grass junk vehicles stored on the site, site lighting, trash, and other similar issues. Um, inspectors handle both citizen and systematic complaints. Systematic complaints are inspector generated every year. Um, we, we have the city is uh, divided into three sections. Every year, inspectors go through their areas of town, their assigned areas, and identify any um, violations that they find. Once those are identified, they make contact with the property owners and work with them to get the violations corrected. Citizen complaints come in to us either over the counter in our offices or they call, um, they lodge a complaint. We go out, we verify that it is truly a property maintenance complaint and follow the same um, process as we do from, for systematic complaints from there on in. <clears throat> um, Regarding apartment communities, when uh, an interior unit complaint is, when we're made aware of such a complaint, we typically need access to the inside of the unit. We cannot just go into a property or go on a property and into private areas without being invited in. Um, we suggest to tenants that they always start, if they have an issue, they always start with the landlord and su submit a complaint in writing. Keep a record and date of the complaints um, if you don't get a timely response from the landlord for corrective action, that's the time you, you contact us. Um, we can be contacted again by phone. You can call us at 296-2441. You can leave a complaint on our hotline, 296-3286. Um, once you make a complaint, we suggest you keep a photographic record if possible. Keep a written record of everything you've tried to do, every response you've gotten from your, your landlord. And the reason for that is just in case you don't get satisfaction and you have to take, you may have to take um, further action if our efforts, if you feel it takes too long, because sometimes our efforts can take, can be lengthy. Um, in 2008, 2009, what, one other thing, um, uh, tenants very often uh, are, concerned with making um, a complaint. And the reason for that is they're, they are afraid of retaliation. Um, if you feel a landlord is retaliating, um, you can contact Miami Valley Fair Housing and they can walk you through what you can do to deal with that. So you should not let that be a concern with, with making a complaint for your rights as a tenant. Um, we did start systematic apartment inspections in 2009. The intent was to maintain and improve sound maintenance 
um, and management at rental properties. There are benefits to the tenants as well as to the landlord, as well as to the city. Um, initially, we focused on units of 25 and up, and uh, in the last few years, we've also focused on smaller um, developments. I said units, I meant developments. Um, we appear to be getting good, fairly good cooperation so far. Um, sometimes, occasionally, there's difficulty, but again, we, we stick with it. We work through it until we get um, results. Uh, we have to remember landlords have a duty to do whatever is re reasonably necessary to ensure premises are kept in fit and habit habitable condition. They have to apply with all, comply with all applicable codes and routinely assess their buildings and grounds to make sure that it meets um, acceptable standards, not just for the code, but the standard of living for their tenants. Tenants also have a responsibility. They understand your lease, follow the terms of the lease, maintain the part of the property that you have control over, and um, use, and use the equipment and facilities in a good manner, um, a good and safe manner. Um, conduct yourselves and your guests in a manner that won't disturb other residents and allow access per the terms of the lease for landlords if they have to come in and do any work. Um, let's see. Uh, some issues we faced in the past um, that are not really covered in our code are bed bugs. Um, we have had complaints. We, we look to both the tenants and the landlords to resolve those complaints jointly, and we encourage that. Um, if you have any questions on that, you can give us a call. In closing, again, I'd like to stress, know your lease, understand your rights and responsibilities as a tenant. Never be afraid to contact our inspectors, again, at 296-2441. Um, our code is available on the city's website or through the Planning and Development Department if you need to, you know, take a look at it yourselves. And with that, I think that's all I have to say, and I will pass it on to Matthew, I believe, is next. Thank you very much. Good, good morning. I'm uh, Matthew Curry, and I'm an attorney with Advocates for Basic Legal Equality, um, or ABLE. And together, ABLE and our uh, partner law firm, Legal Aid of Western Ohio, we are nonprofit law firms. Uh, we are regional in that we serve an area um, of 32 counties, which is generally from the Montgomery County um, all the way up north to Lucas County. And we go up towards Sandusky and um, Mansfield as well. Um, and our focus is on providing uh, high quality legal assistance in civil matters. Uh, to eligible low-income individuals and groups in Western Ohio, um, helping them achieve uh, self-reliance, equal justice, and economic opportunity. Um, so what I do is I manage the, um, the housing work at uh, both law firms. Um, and before I talk anymore, I'm gonna uh, give folks a number. And if you are uh, interested in receiving uh, legal assistance, we have an intake line that you can call. Um, that number is uh, one 888-534-1432. And you can also apply online at uh, www.legalaidline.org. So uh, just uh, generally what our law firms do is we are divided up into practice areas. Um, and we work with uh, individuals dealing with uh, health care and public benefits. Uh, we work with individuals on um, and families on achieving a, a meaningful and appropriate education, so helping uh, children as achieve the education that they're entitled to. Uh, we also um, are focused on independence and self-determination for women and children in poverty. Uh, we have a migrant farm workers unit that works with um, with farm workers, and we also have. Um, some special projects, um, including a foreclosure defense project. Uh, what I oversee, though, is the uh, the housing and economic development work, and just sort of generally the things that we do that are probably relevant for today's talk. Uh, we handle a lot of eviction defenses. We handle terminations from the different HUD subsidized programs, and we see and handle a lot of conditions issues. Um, so we are representing tenants in um, disputes with their landlords. Um, so Joanne touched on a handful of the uh, responsibilities of tenants and the obligations that landlords have um, under 
under Ohio law. Um, I just want to make uh, maybe two points that I think are important for tenants to know, um, and then we'll let John talk about the Fair Housing Center, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, but the, the first is, uh, what happens when tenants um, think their landlord isn't doing something? Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, we get tenants come in and they say, well, my landlord hasn't, you know, fixed the refrigerator or, you know, the, this window's broken and it has been fixed. So I just stopped paying rent and um, fixed it myself. And under Ohio law, that is not um, what a tenant should be doing. Um, Ohio law sets out a process called the rent escrow process. And that is the mechanism for tenants to, um, to get repairs made to their, to their units. And it's extremely important that tenants know to keep paying rent. So even if the landlord's not doing something that he or she is required to do, um, as a tenant, you are still obligated to pay rent. And what you can do in order to get your, um, your problem fixed is give the landlord a written notice um, identifying the problem and giving the landlord a reasonable amount of time to repair the problem. And you want to provide that to the same place that you pay rent. Uh, you want to keep a copy of that notice for yourself. Um, you can either give it in person um, or by certified mail so you know that the landlord has received it. And like I said earlier, you want to be paying rent. You have to be current with rent in order to use this process. So the landlord has a period of time to make a repair. Um, if the landlord fails to make the repair, um, if the landlord makes the repair, that's great. You don't need to do anything else. If the landlord fails to make the repair, then after um, typically 30 days, you can go to uh, the local munis municipal court here in Kettering, and you can bring a copy of your letter to the landlord, and you can bring your, um, your rent check when rent becomes due, and you can what's called deposit it with the court um, into escrow. And at that point, the court um, will let the landlord know what's going on, and the landlord can request a hearing. Um, and then the, the local magistrate or judge will um, hear what you have to say, what the dispute is, and hear to make sure that the landlord either has made the repairs or, if not, um, set up a schedule for the repairs to be, repairs to be made. Um, and then the second thing I just wanted to touch on was um, eviction hearings. Um, you know, we, we have... A lot of people calling us who are in the eviction process, they, they've either received a notice that they're going to be evicted or they've received papers from the court. And I just wanted to let folks know uh, who are tenants that if you receive eviction papers, really the most important thing for you to do is to show up to the hearing um, that the court has scheduled. If you don't show up, um, the landlord is just going to be uh, given what's called possession of the property, um, which means that you are going to be set out. Um, so if you do show up, um, then you can present your side of the story um, and, you know, at the minimum have the chance to tell the magistrate, you know, what's going on. Um, and it's much better to show up than to not show up so you, you know, have an understanding of how, you know, the process works um, if the eviction is granted. So with that, I look forward to questions and I'll pass it on to John. Thanks, Matt. Um, uh, as you said, my name is John Zimmerman, and I'm the Vice President of the Miami Valley Fair Housing Center. And uh, I have a couple of uh, brochures here. Uh, this is our regular brochure from the Fair Housing Center. And then I also have a brochure, which I'll refer to a little bit later, called Fair Housing Tips for Welcoming People with Disabilities. And um, the uh, fair housing, I'm going to read real quickly from this brochure. Uh, fair housing means you may freely choose a place to live without regard to your race, color, religion, sex, national origin, or because you are disabled or have children 17 and under in your family. Also in the state of Ohio, uh, people cannot be discriminated against based on their ancestry or their military status. So all jurisdictions, including Kettering, uh, have at least these nine areas of protection under fair housing law. And some jurisdictions, like some neighboring jurisdictions, have some others, like uh, age as a protected class, like in the city of Dayton, but we don't have that here under fair housing laws. 
And what the Miami Valley Fair Housing does is that we have a contract uh, with the city of Kettering in order to give service to residents of Kettering um, who are having problems uh, with a landlord uh, or other things. It could be with a real estate transaction, an insurance transaction, uh, a lending transaction. So fair housing covers uh, transactions that are related to the place where you live, okay? Uh, and today we are talking uh, about rental situations. And so when people feel that they've been discriminated against based on one of these protected classes like race or because of their gender or because uh, they have children uh, in their family, uh, then uh, the city of Kettering has set it up that you can give us a call, and our phone number is 937-223-6035. And what we do is that we listen to your experience, uh, we evaluate what uh, you have to say, and then we inform you of your rights and options. Um, what we can do after that is that we can investigate your claim of discrimination. Uh, and if, in fact, uh, we or maybe some experts that we would bring in to hear your story feel that there is some reason to proceed with a uh, discrimination uh, complaint, uh, we could assist you in filing or refer you to an attorney that would help you file a case. And so those are our basic services uh, uh, for helping uh, uh, tenants. And uh, one of the things that's important is that when tenants and landlords have problems is to decide on whether this is a problem with uh, one's civil rights or is it a problem with the contract you have with your landlord. And if it's a problem with, the, with your contract, we'll refer you to Matt and to legal aid. So uh, Joanne uh, Meijas brought up a really good point that um, people who are renting uh, are, uh, should not uh, live in fear of being retaliated against. And when retaliation from a landlord occurs, okay, uh, if it is in fact based on one of the protected classes, then in fact we would be uh, the appropriate place to call. However, sometimes we see retaliation occur and it doesn't have anything to do uh, with whether uh, uh, somebody's gender or because of their race, it's just, it just happens. And in, in that point, we would, if it's not a civil rights matter, we would again refer to legal aid. And it's really great to be here with Matt today because um, um, most problems occur under the landlord-tenant law of 1974, and legal aid covers that, or it happens under uh, Ohio fair housing laws, and we cover that. And so you could call with whatever problem, either to legal aid or us, and we can soon discover uh, which place it's best to look at your problem. And, and we're happy, you know, to uh, give you, you know, give tenants uh, that advice. Um, one of the things that we also uh, want to uh, talk about today are uh, the rights of people with disabilities because people with disabilities and families with children, unlike all the other protected classes, did not have protection under the original fair housing laws that were passed in 1968. Um, the people with disabilities uh, and families with children, that protection was added 20 years later in 1988. And so it's taken a while for that to seep into everyone's mind that in fact these are protected areas. And um, so, uh, and one of the things that we've experienced uh, are people with disabilities who don't live in institutions as they did in the past. They're living out in the community and are an integral part of our society. And so, uh, as a result of that, uh, there's a greater need 
for uh, people uh, with disabilities to ask for things like a modification to uh, their unit uh, that they're going to live in. They might need a ramp, a widened doorway, they might need grab bars. And they're, under that situation, both the tenants and landlords have responsibilities. Tenants need to really make it clear to the landlord exactly what they're asking for, okay? And uh, in most situations, the tenants have to recognize that they're responsible for paying for the modifications. And uh, the landlord also, though, really needs to listen to the person with the disability because they really have the best knowledge of what their needs are. And so the Justice Department has come out with some thoughts about this, and uh, one of the things that they've said in one of their memos is that um, uh, tenants and landlords need to work together in what they call the interactive process, and both parties need to be a part of this. And so um, when, in fact, uh, you discover uh, that you need some modification or a change in a rule, okay, um, uh, that, you know, that bars you from enjoying your unit, uh, then you need to clearly talk to the landlord uh, about that. And if you would have a problem, uh, either the landlords could give us a call if they don't understand what's going on or what the process is, or if a, the tenant would know, they could call us. And we have helped many landlords and tenants walk through the process. Uh, it might be in a situation where it's a complex that has a no pets rule, and this is the first time a landlord has ever been asked to allow a service service animal to live there. And so we can educate everyone. We can educate the other tenants who might say, why do they get to have a dog and I don't? Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to come out and, and educate them, uh, the landlords, and the person who has the need about the process to achieve uh, what, what you'd like to have. So this is a great brochure, and it's available uh, on our website uh, at www. And I'll say this slowly because it's long. M V, and then the word fair, F A I R, housing, H O U S I N G, dot com. Then put a forward slash and the word rental. So it's www.mvfairhousing.com forward slash rental. And this whole brochure, this brochure is also available here at 3600 Shroyer Road at the Kettering Government Center. And uh, it's available if you wanted to give us a call, we could mail you one of these. Uh, and we really would love both landlords and uh, renters to call and get one of these brochures uh, at 223-6035. And so this is a newer area of the law, and so I wanted to just spend a little time in talking uh, about that, uh, and then maybe later we'll have uh, some questions. The other area, and I'm going to end with this, is working with families with children. And uh, families with children, uh, let me tell you that what uh, landlords under fair housing laws are expected to do is to have a reasonable occupancy standard so that families with children can rent. So if there is a two-bedroom home, the reasonable standard is two per bedroom or four people allowed in that home. So if we have two bedrooms and the landlord is restricting that to one person or two persons, uh, that probably eliminates uh, a lot of families with children from living there. And so uh, I want landlords to know uh, that um, on the same website that I talked about uh, that uh, has the fair housing tips for welcoming people with disabilities, uh, that website uh, also has a eight-page primer on fair housing called Non-Discriminatory Rental Practices. And it talks about HUD's a vision of occupancy standards and why two per bedroom is a reasonable standard. And so for tenants, in fact, on the other hand, who uh, we had a family of seven who came to us and they wanted to rent a two bedroom uh, apartment. And uh, so seven people in two bedrooms and they were all five kids were in high school. And, you know, we explained to them how, and HUD explains in the document how, uh, 
occupancy standards avoid overcrowding. Uh, landlords can't afford to have their plumbing battered uh, and the electric, I mean, it's only made to uh, withstand so much use without it going bad very quickly. And so that's why it's just for safety and sanitary reasons that the United States in most places have that occupancy standard of two per bedroom. And so that for that family, we just had to suggest to them they needed to find a larger home. And so uh, when people again have questions uh, about occupancy standards, uh, they could you know give us a call and we can talk to both landlords or tenants about that. So with that, um, I think we are going to turn it back to the moderator who, I, I don't know if you have questions for us or if the audience does. Well, I don't have any questions right now, but I thank you for your presentations. And now we open up the floor to any questions. Yes, ma'am. If you'd like to step forward. Hi. I, this one's for Matthew. Uh, Matthew, you said that you should show up for an eviction hearing. Um, what recourse do you have at an eviction hearing if you haven't actually been paying rent? <laughs> well, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll just backtrack a little bit and talk about um, some tenant obligations. Um, and then hopefully get to your question. <laughs> um, so tenants' rights come from a few different places. Uh, they come from, as John and Joanne talked about, they come from the rental agreements, the contracts. Um, they come from state law. As John talked about, they also come from federal law and then also um, local law, municipal law. Um, under um, uh, the rental agreement, most likely, and also state law, if a tenant is not paying rent, the landlord has the right to um, seek an eviction. So you want to, the reason that a tenant would want to show up to the eviction hearing, um, in my mind, is, you know, while the, you know, if the landlord um, has a legitimate reason to proceed with an eviction, has provided the proper notice um, in order to get into court, um, and that notice, it's a three-day notice that the landlord must give the tenant before the landlord can file the eviction in court. And the notice has to have specific language, um, and it has to, you know, um, be delivered to the tenant three days before the eviction is actually filed with the court. Um, that when you're in court with the landlord, uh, what we have seen in practice is that um, the court will give you more time to move out if you actually show up. Um, whereas if you don't show up, the court will typically give you less time. Um, so A, you know, if you need to move, um, showing up allows you to actually get more time to move. Um, you know, B, it's also a chance to talk to the landlord and maybe try to work it out. Um, if you come up to court with, with money, uh, the landlord may take it. Under Ohio law, the landlord is not required to, um, to take the rent that's owed at the eviction hearing. Um, we are not what's called a um, pay-to-stay state, um, like some states are. So the landlord is not required to take your money at the eviction hearing, even if you have it. Um, but it may be in the landlord's best interest to take your money um, to let you stay. That, that answers my question. But because I, I, I asked that because there are probably just as many people in rental situations that can't pay as there are people in mortgage situations that can't pay. And I just wondered if there was some kind of way that they could get some um, I don't know, forbearance, for lack of a better term. And by showing up, do they have that opportunity to argue that case that uh, I've been laid off for six weeks, but if I can do this, this, and this, I can catch up. That's So by showing up, you're saying you do have that kind of uh, ability to plead your own case? Exactly. And, you know, it, it's not a defense to the eviction to tell the court, well, I can pay this money in a week, um, right? The court won't to listen to you. They're probably not going to um, side with you. you know, but like I said, the landlord may have an interest in working with you. It may be easier for the landlord to you know, work out an agreement where you're going to, the tenant will pay money in a week, um, 
and if you don't pay money in the week, then you could proceed with the eviction. It's just maybe it's easier for the landlord to, you know, enter into an agreement like that um, versus, you know, actually going through the full process of evicting, um, you know, then making sure the tenant moves out, then trying to find a new renter for the house. Um, so it just increases your options. Mm -hmm. And I have one other question. I'll probably sit down if I can get this answer. Um, this is for John. Same kind of scenario, but except someone is actually renting from a person who they're current with their rent, but their landlord's not current with the bank, and all of a sudden, oops, I'm in a house that might be foreclosed on. When I have rent receipts, what is their recourse? Um, there's a federal law, and there's a... a um, on the Attorney General's website here in Ohio, there's a link to it, uh, and uh, that if a renter, in fact, is uh, in a home that's foreclosed on, um, the during the foreclosure process, either a new owner or a bank or whatever, uh, they have to give some regard to the tenant, and uh, usually the tenant needs to continue paying rent. Uh, uh, so that they can stay there, but they have to, if the house, in fact, is going to have to be vacated or something like that, um, and maybe Matt can help me. I think that is, is it 90 days that they get? So I know you probably know about this law, too, and uh, not having it right in front of me, <laughs> I hate to actually quote, so uh, maybe Matt can help me out a little, the, and I don't remember the exact name, but there is uh, uh, a, a, a whole uh, history of it on the Attorney General's website. What do you know, Matt? Yeah, so I mean, this is a really um, tricky situation for tenants to be in. Um, you might not know who to pay rent to. You th may think there's a foreclosure. You, you may think the bank owns the house. Um, you know, but really you should be paying rent to the person you have the lease with, the landlord, until you're told otherwise. Because the landlord, the person who you're renting with, is going to own that house, even if it's the foreclosure action has been filed, until the bank actually gets judgment. Um, and it's once, you know, once the judgment occurs and, um, and possession is then given over to the bank, um, that the, uh, the existing landlord is the owner. And that's who, you know, has the ability to enter into uh, lease agreements with tenants. So um, probably four years ago, the federal government passed a law called the Protecting Tenants and Foreclosure Act, or PTFA. And what it says basically is that if you have a bona fide tenancy, so if you have a lease with a landlord, and then um, the house goes into foreclosure and it's actually, um, the foreclosure goes through, that the, the lease is honored, um, you know, either with um, the 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 longer of two periods, either 90 days or the actual term of the lease. So let's say you're on a month-to-month -month, um, and uh, your landlord loses the house to foreclosure and a bank takes it over. The bank has to honor um, at least a 90-day uh, tenancy or lease with the person who's residing there. Um, you know, the, the flip side is, let's say you're in a, you know, the second month of a year-long lease. Um, so you have two mo 10 months left on your lease, and the foreclosure occurs, and the bank takes possession. Um, the bank would have to honor the full 10 months um, of, of your lease. And one thing we're seeing um, is that uh, banks are, tr you know, sometimes try to use the eviction or use the foreclosure process to evict tenants. And they'll name these John Doe's or Jane Doe's in the foreclosure, um, and then they'll say, well, we have this foreclosure, so we can just, you know, uh, kick you out just because we have this foreclosure and a John Doe or Jane Doe was named. And that's not the case. Um, if uh, a bank wants to um, evict um, a tenant or to get possession of, um, get restitution or possession of the house, they actually have to go through the foreclosure or the eviction process. They can't do it through the foreclosure process. Um, you know, but this is a, maybe to follow up on your question, right? If you're, you know, paying rent to your landlord um, and you know, the bank is saying, well, you're not paying rent, so we're going to try to evict you. Um, you know, you can show up to court, you can talk about the, um, the protections for tenants and foreclosure, and, you know, maybe the bank hasn't done it the right way, and the judge will, you know, side with the tenant. So that, um, you said that was PF? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, PTFA? 
is the uh, I guess the, that's the acronym. The, the acronym yeah, protecting for the tenants um, in foreclosure at foreclosure act. Okay, yeah. and so you can get that on the attorney general's website. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and there's a search uh, a button at the top of their website, and just put in protecting tenants and hit enter, and uh, that page will come up. So it's 90 days if it's month to month, and the remaining term of the lease if you have a lease. That's correct. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, do we have any other questions? Hello, my name is Vladimir. I uh, have a couple questions. Um, where can I find out reasonable maintenance schedule um, to repair different uh, appliance uh, items in uh, apartment? Um, I heard like uh, every three years uh, something needs to be repaired, every five years every 10 years, I asked my landlord and she didn't give me any schedule. She said she will just uh, make your judgment when it's need to be repaired. There, there is no, the, the code that we enforce, the city of Kettering enforces, does not refer to maintenance schedules for things like appliances. I would probably refer you to your lease, I, I would assume, Leases would cover that if they don't and you're renting an apartment. I would ask that question up front. Is there such a, a maintenance schedule that you provide? But what you can do is if, as I said before, know your lease, know what you're responsible for and what the, the landlord is responsible for. If it's something that the landlord is responsible to, to keep in good working order and it, it does not work and they refuse to fix it, you can call us the, at the city of Kettering We'll come out, we'll take a look at it. If it's in poor repair, we will issue an order to the landlord to fix it within a certain time frame that, that we decide on. And then, you know, there are, if they do it, wonderful. If they don't do it, there are other steps, legal steps that we can take to ensure it gets done. Mm -hmm. um, Did I answer your question? Um, just want to clarify. I'm not sure that I heard everything you were saying. Yes, yes. Uh, I want to clarify it. Like if I have a refrigerator and heat point, um, a landlord said until it's broken, we're not going to replace it. And carpet, so if I live in an apartment for 20 years, it's mean uh, it's not going to be replaced uh, until I move out. Or it's nothing in a contract mm -hmm. contract uh, when i started was couple pages now it's like 26 pages mm -hmm. but that contract only covers a landlord it doesn't give tenant any rights so. well uh, again that's why i say you know when when you're renting the place you read the contract before you sign it and make sure you can live with that contract um, the property maintenance code enforces issue of health, safety, and welfare. So if it fits those categories and if the code gives us jurisdictions to deal with it, then we can assist you. If not, um, uh, your options may be to, to speak to a lawyer, speak to legal aid perhaps, see what they can do to, to advise you and help you. Mm -hmm. But, uh, for example, something like you said something about a carpet. Y if that carpet yes, is, is laid in a manner that makes it unsafe, we may be able to do something about that. But if it's something like it's stained or something like that, it's not really a health safety issue. So chances are we can't do much about that. But if the electricity doesn't work or the heat isn't maintained to a temperature at the right time of year that the code says it should be, or if you're running water, your utilities are off, those kinds of things the code covers. If there's holes in the wall or you know windows are broken, things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, this year, my uh, heater, um, I asked a landlord, uh, heater was made in 1971, and usually it's like 10, 15 years until we replace the water heater. So when I said, if it's 71, it's probably going to break. Uh, and she said, when it breaks, then we will address this issue. Yeah. The, and it did break, and I had flood in my apartment. Uh, and then they said, then we will replace the heater. Mm -hmm. Can it be done preventative maintenance if it's reasonable time, like if heater 40 years old, 
to replace not, it, not, not to wait. Not under our code. If it's working, if it's functioning properly, there, there is no time limit. So then know, have as long to as wait. it's functioning properly, there is, there is no issue until, you know, something goes wrong. And it, if it's something going wrong, a disaster. So we have to wait until disaster happens, until I will have this flood in my apartment. Then the disaster will may not happen. So we can't operate based on what may happen. There are so many, a wide variety of things that may happen that never happen. I understand what you're saying, but the code doesn't give us jurisdiction to issue a replacement of a furnace or a water heater based on what may happen. I talk about preventative issue, like uh, in a car, we change the oil, we change the brakes, we don't wait until it will break down, because if it's break down on the road, we will be cited mm -hmm. by police. Mm -hmm. But here, we wait until it's break down, and then it's... Again, if you, if you feel your landlord isn't maintaining something, nothing's gone wrong, but you feel they're not maintaining it and it needs maintenance, that's something you work out with them. I think one recurring theme you heard from all of us is... It's, it's a joint effort between the tenant and the landlord to ensure that things go smoothly once a, a, a lease agreement's been signed. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's an important point, you know, that it is, that, you know, that to the extent you have a choice, you know, that you're comfortable um, with the landlord that you choose if you're a tenant. Um, maybe just a, a couple uh, points that this question raises, I think. Um, you know, really, what is the landlord's obligations to the tenant? Um, you know, we went through some of these, um, you know, complying with uh, the applicable health, safety, and building codes, um, repairing, um, making repairs to make sure the premises is fit and habitable, you know, maintaining common spaces. But the landlord's also responsible for maintaining a good and safe working order and condition uh, what it supplies, right? So the electrical system, the plumbing system, the sanitary system, the heating system, um, if there's, you know, air conditioning, you know, that. If there is uh, a refrigerator to re make sure that <clears throat> the refrigerator works as it should work. Um, you know, and, you know, just because I think a tenant says, you know, I'd like something new, the landlord doesn't necessarily have to provide that. But, you know, if it stops working, you know, in, a man in the way it was working when you moved in, let's say you're in year three of a lease, um, and the refrigerator isn't keeping things as cold as it used to or isn't keeping things cold at all. You know, I think that, that if the landlord's providing the refrigerator, if it's part of the agreement that the landlord provides it under the contract, then I think you could ask for the refrigerator to be, um, to be replaced. Um, so it, it, it really is just there's no right or wrong answer. It's really just kind of, you know, um, kind of a situation by situation um, and how how um, how it would be looked at. Um, the other thing dealing with, um, you know, the, the carpets, you, you know, the, typically tenants put down a deposit um, f when they move into a place. And um, at the end of the lease, uh, when the tenant wants to move out, the tenant wants that deposit back. Um, in order for the tenant to get that deposit back, they have to do a few things. Um, you know, they have to, and I'm going to, Flip through here real quick. Um, you know, they have to give notice, the proper notice to the landlord that they're moving out. Um, they have to provide an address where the deposit can be sent. Um, and then they have to wait 30 days for the landlord to mail them the, the deposit. Um, and you have to provide the keys back to the landlord as well. So you have to give up possession and tell the landlord where to mail the deposit. Um, the deposit is used to protect the, the landlord um, from damage to the property. Um, so tenants are responsible for um, damage beyond what's called normal wear and tear, right? So if there's a hole in the wall, the tenant is probably going to be responsible for paying for that hole. But if, you know, the carpet's 10 years old, um, you've lived there for three years, and it's starting to fade, you know, the tenant may not be responsible for putting in new carpet if it's part of the landlord's costs of doing business and if they would typically be replacing the carpet, you know, every 10 years or so. Um, you know, and again, it's kind of a case-by-case -case situation, but, it, you know, this normal wear and tear um, is allowed at a unit, and the tenant should not be penalized for normal wear and tear, for using the property as it's supposed to be used. Um, anything beyond that, the tenant is responsible for. If you think you're entitled to more of your deposit back than the landlord gives you, you um, 
tenants can proceed with an action in small claims court. Um, and it's a pretty, um, you know, pro se friendly um, proceeding, you know, where you can go down to the municipal court. Um, they may even have um, a sample um, sample um, so that you can uh, use to file your complaint with. Um, the important thing if you're filing a small claims um, against your landlord is that you actually name the correct party. Um, you know, so let, you may know your landlord as Joe, but your lease could be with, you know, like his company that rents, that he's renting with. So you don't want to necessarily sue your landlord in, individually. You want to look to your lease and you want to see who the landlord is on the lease. And that's the party you want to name um, in a small claims complaint. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, another question about um, rentals insurance. Uh, a couple years ago, my landlord started acquired uh, rental insurance. So it's kind of more expense on me, and um, nothing you can do about it. So I went to my insurance company where I have car, and they quote me rental insurance, and I start providing uh, rental insurance for my landlord. Last year, landlord gave me the paper which my insurance agent need to sign, and on that paper, what said that cover fire and water, and insurance agent said the fire we can cover, anything else we can cover, but not the water because water, it's not, she used specific insurance language, not something like, not domain or something, so we don't cover it. I call another insurance company and they said we don't cover the water. So then I went back to landlord and I said, insurance companies don't cover, they don't want to sign that paper, they're willing to uh, draw me uh, the insurance, but not cover that particular one, water. So what to do? Then she said, but we have insurance company with who we have our own contract and they will cover everything just go with our insurance company, and the insurance company much more expensive. And I just wonder, how does it work legally that landlords steer me over to the insurance company? Right, so this is a pretty um, specific question, fact-specific, and I don't want to speculate as to um, kind of the the legality of whether or not your landlord was acting correctly or whether or not he was acting or she was acting incorrectly. But just generally speaking, um, you know, landlords are allowed to um, include terms in the lease um, so long as they don't go against what is set out in state law. Um, and I would think that landlords can generally require tenants to have renter's insurance. Um, there are some exceptions to that, I think, depending on the type of housing. So I talked earlier about we work with um, tenants who are in different subsidized housing um, situations. And in those situations, there may be limits um, on what the landlord can require related to renter's insurance. Um, but I think generally it's permissible. Um, whether or not there are requirements that are so onerous that you're describing um, that make it nearly impossible to get insurance, um, is a different question, and I don't feel like I know enough to specifically answer your question. Um, you know, the fact that the landlord you think may be steering you towards, you know, you know, his or her friend who may be offering insurance is, you know, the same kind of thing. Like, I don't know enough of your situation specifically to answer that question. Um, but I would say if you do have um, a concern about that, um, you know, you should talk to a lawyer who can actually review um, your lease, um, look at what's, what's being required, and look at what the landlord's offering to see if there are any problems. Okay. Well, one more question, if I can. Um, in general, I heard that there is some scores if uh, each person, each citizen has similar like mm, my credit score. There is some information about me which in a national database 
maybe it's called rental database, I don't know, and landlord said that we will run your background check. You have to pay $25, and it will include all those uh, checks, including the rentals check. I'm just wondering what type of database here in America exists on me that landlord looking and how I can improve those scores, if it's such a scores really exist and where I can read about it and is it legal to c collect some information about me to put in a database, is that based on uh, what criteria? Yeah, so I don't know what kind of database a landlord in your situation is looking at, but generally landlords do uh, will do a background check. Um, you know, they will look into things like credit history. They may look at things, that whether or not there's been criminal convictions. Um, they may try to look for prior landlord references or ask for those. And it, it, those things are generally permissible. Um, and it's generally coming from publicly available information. You know, so they can, you know, there are services out there that will search, you know, websites, the court's website, to see if there's been an eviction filed or if there's been some sort of criminal history. Um, I think to the extent that there are limits to that are when it comes up against some of the um, protected classes John was talking about, um, where, you know, if, is what they're doing, um, you know, kind of singling out, you know, a, a character trait or um, an activity that may kind of um, affect or bring into place someone's national origin or race or, um, you know, a familial status issue. So I don't, John, I don't know if you've looked into or thought about sort of how landlords, um, you know, do these kind of background screenings before tenants come in, but it seems that there could be some fair housing issues there. There might be some fair housing issues, but we've also discovered over the past five years, especially in uh, the Dayton area being adjacent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, that more and more landlords are in fact using third-party services that do uh, credit and criminal background checks uh, both here in the United States and abroad. And so that if somebody comes from uh, Turkey or they come from Mexico or they come from Canada, uh, these third-party services have access to do a uh, background check for somebody from Mexico City, and they look at landlord references just like you would uh, somebody that uh, would live here for a long time and stuff because uh, a lot of landlords uh, with uh, the Miami Valley area are influx of both immigrants and refugees who are here legally is several hundred percent higher than the average across the United States. And so the landlords here don't want to lose that market. They would like to rent to that market. And being able to do background checks for uh, immigrants or refugees has become an important part of the rental market. And I suspect uh, that over the next five to ten years, that will become the normal that people that most third-party services will, in fact, be doing both domestic and international uh, background checks. And so that um, I don't know uh, uh, where you're from, but uh, that the background check, in fact, would be done in that country. You know, and, and not here. So there isn't a database that I know of here that collects all this stuff about immigrants, okay? It's, it's that the third-party services actually uh, do their search uh, over in those other countries and come up with data just as if you were renting in that country. Uh, I'm asking about American database. Do I have access via the tenant has access to the database and can we request our score and then appeal if it's not it's, right? For example, like a credit score. Similar. Yeah, uh, the, uh, I mean, the only ones that I know of are the, uh, because I'm not in that business, I mean, uh, well, it would probably be best to find out who a third-party service is and ask them that question, you know. Uh, and so um, any uh, credit agency, you know, Experion, TransUnion, any of them, um, you can go on their websites and find out how to contact them and ask them, you know, uh, that question. Thank you. And do we have any other questions? Yes. 
That's all right. Take your time. Hello, I'm Linda Lipinski, and I'd like to direct my question to Joanne. Does Kettering ever do radon testing? No. Okay. I was just wondering because um, in June, I had lung cancer surgery, and in yesterday's Dayton Daily News, they said that um, the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers is um, possibly radon gas. So I was just wondering, in the future, would Kettering ever, Kettering be, ever want to do something like that? Um, I, I don't know what could happen in the future. The state doesn't have, uh, to my knowledge, a, a, a requirement for testing. Um, it is a relatively simple and inexpensive thing to test for radon in, in, a, okay. in a property. There are kits you can buy at certain retailers. Um, relatively simple, you open it up, you place it wherever in the property that you're concerned with, and then you send off the, the strip to a lab and they will let you know if any radon's been detected. And you're, you're right, uh, there is the EPA website, epa.gov. Okay. that you can go on and, and there's plenty of information about um, radon and things you can do there. Uh, there is a, um, it said in the article that there is an environmental fair at the Montgomery County Environmental Lab in, um, on Dryden Road in Moraine on Tuesday, October the 1st. And um, so they will be giving out free uh, radon testing kits at that time. So I thought That's that may thing. be of interest. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, and there are there any other questions from the floor? Well, if not, we'd like to thank Ms. Mejias, Mr. Curry, Mr. Zimmerman, and those of you that came. I hope it's been informative and this should end our discussion.